Good morning. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Len Calabres, past president of the Board of Trustees. Today's forum uh, is special, not only because of its time and day of the week, but because we have two distinguished speakers who are married to each other. Steve and Koki Roberts are, each in their own right, among America's most renowned, respected, and recognizable journalists, commentators, and authors. Mary Martha Corinne Morrison Claiborne Boggs Roberts, better known as Koki, is an Emmy Award-winning senior news analyst for National Public Radio and a political commentator for ABC News. She is the author of the national bestseller, We Are Our Mother's Daughters, as well as Founding Mothers, The Women Who Raised Our Nation. Stephen B. Roberts is a contributing editor at U.S. News & World Report, appears regularly on CNN and MSNBC, and often fills in as substitute host of the Diane Rehm Show on NPR. He is the author of My Father's Houses and From Every End of This Earth, 13 Families and the New Lives They Made in America. The Roberts together write a nationally syndicated news column and co-authored in 2000, From This Day Forward, a New York Times bestseller about their experiences as an interfaith couple. Their new book, Our Haggadah, Uniting Traditions for Interfaith Families, has been described as a book that all can read and understand, at once a practical, accessible Haggadah for Passover and a roadmap of sorts for interfaith couples. My favorite re reviewer's comments says, it's like having a seat at their Passover Seder uh, table. So please join me in warmly welcoming this morning to our Cleveland City Club podium, Stephen Koki Roberts. Well, thank you so much. It's a treat to be here with you. Um, Steve has been here several times before, so I'm glad I got to come this time. Um, and I always love coming back to Cleveland. It's a beautiful day here today, and the city looks great. I used to uh, actually c come all the time because I produced a television program here 45 years ago <laughs> called It's Academic. It was a high school quiz show, you remember? And uh, the sponsor was the Illuminating Company. And uh, all the folks from the Illuminating Company came to our wedding, in fact. And uh, <laughs> so, so it is a, a treat to be back. Well, it is, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, and there are, uh, because of, among other things, in addition to being my third trip, I think, to the City Club, uh, I do a Monday morning conversation every Monday morning with the wonderful Bill Wills on WTAM. And so I feel that I know Cleveland, because every Monday I'm talking to, mm -hmm. to folks in, in Cleveland also. One of my favorite all-time former students is here, Gail Horowitz, <laughs> and, uh, uh, who um, is a wonderful young citizen of, of Cleveland and a great contributor to this community. And the real, but the real reason I love coming back to Cleveland is I grew up in a town very much like this. I grew up in a town called Bayonne, New Jersey. It's a small version of Cleveland. <laughs> um, but I've said many times that when I went on and went to Harvard and then uh, to the New York Times and was covering national politics, particularly in the late 70s and early 80s when um, the great upheaval in American politics and the great uh, change that people had to understand was the movement of a lot of traditional Democrats, immigrant families, often labor-based families, out of the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. And um, I had a great advantage over my Ivy League educated colleagues because <laughs> I didn't ever forget where I came from. And um, I knew every way to spell the word kibasa. And, um, <laughs> And uh, I, you know, played on the VFW uh, basketball team and the Elks Club baseball team. And I would come to a town like Cleveland, and I, uh, I felt at home. I felt at home as a reporter. I understood the mores and the neighborhoods uh, of, of, of this city because I grew up in, in a very similar place. So I've, I've always had a great affection for Cleveland. Um, and really, uh, uh, my hometown, as it always does, uh, has a lot to do with this book in many ways, because I grew up in a community that was very heavily Jewish. 
um, in Bayonne. In fact, I kid about Bayonne. Uh, it was 19% Jewish and 80% Catholic. Um, I thought Protestants were a tiny minority group, <laughs> some weird sect. Imagine my surprise when I went off to Harvard. <laughs> Charlie Bolton was there. <laughs> no, you're the only Protestant I knew at Harvard. <laughs> Actually, there are a lot of Boltons and a lot of Elliots and a lot of Kirklands. I've never met anybody with a name like yours. You know, so crisp, so short. <laughs> Ended in a consonant. I mean, in, in, in fact, that always goes well over well in a town like Cleveland because you always, you guys, you guys understand what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And um, one of the first guys I ever met uh, was C. Boyden Gray, our classmate. You know, <laughs> uh, went on to an eminent career, counsel to the first President Bush. I'd never met anybody whose last name was four letters, and not only that, but he used his first initial, C. Boyden Gray. We didn't do that in Bayonne. <laughs> What, C. Vinnie Nuccio? <laughs> M. Pauli Polowski? It was not our style. But the thing about Bayonne was that he, he, in terms of this book and in terms of our faith journey together, I grew up in this very um, heavily uh, Jewish community and, 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 and deeply Jewish family from a tribal point of view, but not from a religious point of view. Um, my grandparents, both of my grandfathers, uh, uh, were uh, devoted to Jewish life and institutions. My one grandfather had been a chalutz, a Zionist pioneer in Palestine in 1906-1907. Um, my other grandfather uh, uh, was uh, deeply devoted to an organization some of you know of called the Workmen's Circle. Uh, the Arbeiter Ring, it was a, a Jewish socialist organization, uh, social service organization. And so I grew up in this world where I, I knew I was Jewish, but had never set foot in a synagogue. In fact, neither of my grandfathers were ever bar mitzvahed. My father was never bar mitzvahed. I was the first male in many generations to be bar mitzvahed, and that was because I asked for it. Presence. Uh, presence, yes. <laughs> and, and, and he only had to do half. He has a twin. Yeah, I have a twin. I cheated. <laughs> but um, so... Uh, I didn't grow up with any uh, uh, observance as, as part of my life. Um, and um, uh, it was really a, a great shock uh, to my parents, however, when I went off to Harvard and they said, you know, go off in the wider world. The day I went to Harvard, I had exceeded the world my parents had lived in. They had lived in, when my parents met, they lived one block apart. And I had grandparents, one in the house, one three blocks apart. That was my world. I could walk to every important point in my world growing up. When I left the college, my mother had lived in two houses her entire life, four blocks apart. But that's recognizable to Cleveland. You, you'd understand neighborhoods like that. And you understand communities like that. And then I went off to Harvard, and somewhat to my parents' surprise, brought home this Catholic girl. Just surprise and dismay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's be real. Yeah, let's be real. <laughs> but. Um, and of course, we, we dated for years. Now we were only eighteen and nineteen when we met. But um, but I always accused Steve of uh, of using religion as an excuse not to marry me. You know um, that he was he was just finding a, a reason. And um, finally, finally, after you know four years of dating, uh, he proposed by saying, "Oh, all right, Koki." <laughs> I thought that was kind of romantic. Uh, but apparently she's held a grudge for 45 years about that. And so uh, then there was, of course, the question of the wedding, right? And uh, always fraught. And um, so we, we you know, tried our best to make it work for everybody. So we were getting married after sundown on Saturday night uh, in the garden of our home, not in any, anybody's sanctuary except our families. And um, under a chuppah, um, and uh, we you notice how she says chuppah. <laughs> I mean, she's learned something too over forty five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, and um, we had we we had my uncle the Jesuit as one of the uh, celebrants. Uh, he had no choice, and um, and then of course we tried and tried and tried to find a rabbi, and um, no rabbi would marry us. 
And uh, finally, Steve's mother says to me, oh, Koki, you know, really, I find this search for a rabbi just distasteful. You know, she did. I was the one doing it, right? And, and in fact, there was a rabbi who everybody, you know, on the rumor mill, there was a rabbi who did them, you know, mixed marriages. And he worked in the Johnson White House. And so I called the White House, and, and he answers the phone, and I said, Rabbi, and he said, I'll call you back from a pay phone. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in Bayonne, I was used to the numbers runners who used the pay phones, but I, wasn't, I didn't know any rabbis who did their business out of a pay phone. His day, on his day job, he wasn't a rabbi. So, um, so Steve's mother says, so why don't you, you know, in our tradition, really, it's, it doesn't have to be a rabbi. It's just a learned man. So why don't you get a learned man, like, say, for instance, oh, Arthur Goldberg, you know, and... Um, <laughs> And so, now he was a good friend of my family's, and, um, and so we asked him, and he did agree to, to be one of the um, celebrants. Um, and the wedding was going to be a big, a big deal wedding. Um, my father at the time was majority whip of the House of Representatives, and, um, and very close to President Johnson, uh, he and my mother both. And, um, and my mother got him on a bad night and said, you know, Hale, um, you've got to tell me how many people in the House of Representatives you want to have to this wedding. And he didn't want to answer that question, so he said, all the Democrats. Well, that was after the 1964 landslide, and um, <laughs> so there were more than 300 Democrats in the House. And so by the time we had all of them and some friendly Republicans and, um, and the real enemy, some senators, and, um, and <clears throat> then the entire extended family, and we then got to some people we actually liked, um, we were... <laughs> We were at 1,500 people, yes. And my mother cooked for the whole thing. I am not making that up. No, she, she did. My mother is, I'm happy to say, still thriving at 95 and not cooking. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> when our daughter got married in the same spot 31 years later, I said to her, Mama, why did you do that? Why did you cook for all that? Because trust me, it did not occur to me to cook. And um, she said, <laughs> She said, well, it was cheap, you know, and, but at any rate, um, so this was, you know, that, this was the wedding that was about to be, and, um, and so I come uh, tripping out the front door to get married, and just about this point, my then not quite five-year-old nephew, who was the ring bearer, turns around and says to my father, Papa, I lost the ring. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so people start handing me rings, you know, to wear down the aisle, and I pull myself up to, you know, my full 22-year-old drama queen moment and say, you know, this is terrible. I can't possibly do this. It's, the symbolism is just all wrong not to have the right ring. And Daddy looks at me and he says, Koki, don't you think there's enough symbolism going on here? <laughs> <everyone?" laughs> so... So, you know, we got married, and actually the president's doctor found Steve's ring, so he's had it since we came back down the aisle. But, um, but because of the wedding, Arthur Goldberg uh, took an interest in us. And the next year, uh, we were living in New York, and uh, he was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. And, um, and uh, the ambassador's residence is at the Waldorf Astoria. And he and Mrs. Goldberg, who was a wonderful person, invited us to Passover. And they had a famous Passover. And um, so it was my first Seder. And it was just wonderful. And so uh, I decided from there on out that we would certainly always celebrate Passover. And the next year, um, they didn't invite us back. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I keep telling so, you, you sang too late. No. And I, um, so... I said to Steve, and I was pregnant for our first child, and I said to Steve, you have to call your parents and tell them that they have to do a Seder for us. This was as surprising as my marrying a Catholic. <laughs> In fact, it was worse. I mean, I, my mother always said that the first Seder she ever went to was organized by her Catholic daughter-in-law. In, in fact, uh, she always said that Koki was the best Jew in the family. This is, this is a really low bar. Yeah. I mean, this is... 
<laughs> not a lot of competition for the no. title in the family. It's but my, the, my mother always says, Stephen is her sweetest child. Same thing. Low <laughs> bar. <laughs> but um, so my parents were living in suburban New Jersey, and uh, my, they were kind of game about this. I mean, they were they sweet, were. and they, they had this little save, just the four of us. And um, in the middle, now. We got used a, the Maxwell House uh, classic Haggadah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, and I have a, Koki mentioned a twin brother. Now, I, he's chosen his life, I've chosen mine. But he married a woman named Anne Stein, a Jewish woman from the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. And the rabbis would have looked at us and said, well, he did it right because he married the Jewish woman, and I did it wrong because I married the Catholic. The truth is, there's never been a shred of Judaism in my brother's household his entire life. Um, well, his kids have come to us. His kids have come to our house. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, it's, a, it's a good example. You know, you would have looked at us 45 years ago and assumed, assumed what life would be like and how it would play out. But that life has a way of playing tricks and, and working out in different ways. And in fact, that first Seder, when we were at my parents' house, my brother actually called in the middle of the Seder, totally unaware there was even Passover. Right? And so the one's married to the Jew. So he, he calls and just to say hello. And um, my father picks up the phone and sort of whispers into the phone, we're having a Seder. <laughs> and, and my brother in Massachusetts, I could hear him. He didn't need the phone. You're having a what? I mean, <laughs> and my father says, yeah, Cokie wanted it. <laughs> so that's how the tradition started. So by the next year, we were in California. And uh, I realized that if I wanted Passover, I actually had to do it. And so um, I went to the neighborhood temple and bought a Haggadah. It was the Reconstructionist Haggadah. And uh, I bought a Seder plate, which I thought was something of a commitment. And, um, and we, we still use it. It has a significant chip, but it, uh, it, you know, it works. And, um, and so we had our first at-home uh, Passover. And after it was over, everybody had views. We had, we had that Haggadah, the Reconstructionist one, and the Maxwell House one. And, um, but everybody had ideas, sorry, that, uh, you know, that we had, I had done it wrong, basically. You know, they were, I, I left out this part. I should have put that in. I shouldn't have put, you know, I had this in that shouldn't be there. I mean, views. And so. Um, what a surprise, Jews arguing. <laughs> and so. The, the next year, I sat down with my, you know, Smith Corona typewriter that I had been given as a high school graduation present and, um, and typed out uh, our, our Haggadah. And, um, and that basically is what our book is, uh, is basically that, that uh, rendition of the service that I wrote low these many, many years ago. And... Um, and it became such a part of our lives, and we became so identified uh, as the Passover home uh, when we were living in California that when we left, uh, we actually, our friends as a going away party present gave us a, a, a Seder, a Passover meal, a month early because uh, we, were, we were not going to be there for Passover. So that was our goodbye party. Uh, and then um, off we went to Greece, where we always celebrated Passover as well. Well, as Koki mentioned, we arrived in Greece just a few weeks before Passover, because we had had that Seder early in, in California. And um, as the day approached, and I was the New York Times correspondent in, in Athens, and uh, somewhat full of myself, and um, Koki assigned me. <laughs> Koki gave me an assignment. She said, you have to buy the matzah. And she said, there's, I hear that there's a synagogue, an old synagogue down near the Acropolis. And perhaps they have a store or there's a shop near there. But that was our best uh, bet of finding, uh, finding matzah. Um, and uh, she said, and if you can't find matzah, get pita bread. At least it's unleavened. That's so, true. So I'm on my way home uh, that night. And I have totally forgotten my assignment. And I haven't been to the synagogue. I haven't been to the neighborhood. I didn't even go to a bakery to get pizza. Uh, I'm here pita. with the two children. Yeah. There were three and five at the time. We're still living in a hotel. So I ducked into a pastry shop on my way home and bought a cheesecake. <laughs> I basically still have not gotten over this. First of all, why on Passover would you go to a pastry shop? You know, let's think about that. So I came in and she says, what are you thinking? What, how can we, pop? I said, it's Jewish, isn't it? <laughs> that didn't go over well either. No. Um, 
uh, but uh, we did have, uh, over the next few years, uh, the Seder, and by the next year, they were selling matzah in the local grocery store. True. But um, uh, we uh, uh, always, in our uh, Seders, we've tried very hard to focus on interfaith families. Almost everybody who ever comes is a, is a mixed religious family. It's certainly true when we lived in Greece. And one of um, uh, our closest friends were a couple. The man was an American Foreign Service officer, a Jewish fellow from Chicago, and he had married a Catholic woman, a Brazilian, in his first foreign posting. And their daughters were the same age as our kids, and they became great friends. In fact, that, that the husband unfortunately died young, but the, his widow and his daughters came to our Passover just a few weeks ago. Oh, they, they still very much and are part of And grandchildren. And grandchildren, yeah, very much a part of our lives. And But anyway, one of their daughters was three years old, and those of you who been to Passovers know that one of the more baffling moments for young children is when you send the youngest child out to look for Elijah, who is the, by lore and legend, the messenger uh, uh, who will herald the coming of the Messiah. So if he shows up, it's a big deal, you know? I mean, <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I sent this child, she was three, Alicia Friedman, out to look for Elijah, and she was a bit of a space case. I mean, she was three, but she was a bit of a space case. Very competent adult, but... <laughs> spacey child. And um, she didn't come back. <laughs> now, Athens was kind of a safe city, so I wasn't really worried about her safety, but I, where was she? So finally, she wanders back in. I said, Alicia, darling, um, <laughs> did you see Elijah? And she said, no, but I saw God. <laughs> it was a high point um, uh, of our <laughs> Passover. But um, it, it, I, I've always been love this, um, uh, this story because a, a year later, our son, who was then by that time about six or seven, and, you know, Elijah didn't show up that year either. So he pulls me aside after the Passover Seder and says, Daddy, uh, when you were growing up and both of your parents were Jewish, did Elijah come to your house? He thought Elijah was boycotting the shiksa. You know, and, uh, <laughs> he did. <laughs> maybe he was. <laughs> It's a good thing he doesn't come because there's not enough food for him. But the um, um, well, so then we, we came home to Washington and we live in the house that I grew up in. Uh, so uh, it is very, uh, very much the family house. And we started having um, our annual seders and, and everybody came. Uh, Steve's parents uh, timed their move from Florida to New Jersey in the winter uh, around Passover and they would come and my mother uh, always came, uh, except for the years when she was the ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, and um, <laughs> in those years, in those years, she actually went to Seder's at the Vatican. She was a very close friend of the Israeli ambassador, whose name was Lopez. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he was a Sephardic Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and her, um, she had a wonderful experience there, actually, all the way around. And, and we were thrilled, of course, when she took that job at, at the age of 81 in a new country, um, because we'd get to go to Rome all the time. Uh, but um, then what happened in this country happened, and my mother found herself representing Bill Clinton to the Pope. Now think of it. Uh, it was the... Um, <laughs> It was the toughest job in the diplomatic service, but um, if anybody could do it, Mama could. Um, but then, uh, then she went back to New Orleans, our home, uh, where her home was right smack dab in the middle of uh, Bourbon Street. If you've been to Bourbon Street, you've been to Mama's house. And um, in fact, when our kids were small, you know, we'd walk past the strippers and the other neighbors, and I'd say, through the woods and over the hills to Grandmother's house, <laughs> we go. And then she moved from Bourbon Street to the Vatican, and um, I teased her that the costumes didn't change. You know, it was <laughs> it was still guys in dresses. But uh, anyway, she um, she would always make a big point of always being at our seders as well as she was this year, yeah. and um, and uh, singing with great gusto. But um, uh, so it really has become uh, this annual uh, event that a lot of people enjoy. In fact, um, it got so big that we couldn't all fit in the dining room uh, for, for a long time. We haven't been able to do that. And other holidays, we kind of just spread out around the house. Uh, but Passover, you all need to be in one room. So we clear the glassed-in porch of furniture, and we bring in tables so it looks for all the world like a VFW hall. But um, but it works. And um, and so for years we've been doing that, and finally uh, somebody said to us, you know, you really ought to 
do a book about this. And, um, and so when we did, um, it basically is still our, our Haggadah, although uh, we explain a lot of things. Steve did boxes about everybody and all of that. And, um, Great Talmudic tradition. And, yes, and, I, and, um, and we also, uh, the, the, the service itself is very much a Jewish service. But we do have introductions and a afterward where we do talk a lot about the connections uh, between uh, Judaism and Christianity. And, um, and, you know, of course, the Last Supper was a Seder, was a Passover meal. And, um, and St. Paul uh, is very clear in the Acts of the Apostles. He talks about how he was a student of Gamaliel, who is one of the rabbis invoked in the Passover meal. And uh, what I had not realized, uh, neither one of us, and we were, when we were, you know, year after year saying these same words, that the rabbis who really are the sort of stars of the Passover, uh, especially Hillel, uh, were these great thinkers in, uh, in Israel around the time of Jesus, Hillel before Jesus, Gamaliel at the same time. Um, and they were of a school of theology that was highly influential in the founding of the church. Uh, and so all of that became very useful and, and interesting information, which we you know, put together in the book, along with recipes and how to set the table and all the things that make it not scary uh, to have a, a Seder meal. And of course, the other thing about Passover that we try to emphasize in our lives, but also in the book, is the universal message of Passover. The, the message is one of a yearning for freedom. And we've been joking about this. But we have been thanking, and I want to, again, shout out, uh, shout out to our new press agent, Hosni Mubarak, um, <laughs> for reminding us uh, of how universal and how ancient this impulse is. You know, if you, if you sum up the message of Passover in one sentence, it's the line from the old black spiritual, let my people go. And we heard right at the time of Passover, uh, just before it, that same, virtually that same sentence, those certainly those same sentiments echoing from Tahrir Square in Egypt and from Tunisia and today from Syria and, and other places throughout the Middle East. So um, uh, it's, it's timely, not only in terms of reminding us of the connections between uh, Judaism and Christianity, but the universal message of a wonderful holiday. So I hope you enjoy this little book. Um, and um, uh, in the great tradition of City Club, we're happy to answer any of your questions about this or anything else that's going on in the world. So uh, thanks again for inviting us back. We appreciate Thank it you. very much. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special forum featuring Steve and Cokie Roberts, uh, journalists, commentators, columnists, authors, most recently of our Haggadah. Now we would like to return to our speakers for our traditional City Club question and answer period. Uh, we welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Uh, holding the microphone today is Carrie Miller, our program director. And uh, as uh, Steve Roberts mentioned, Cokie and Steve are glad to take questions on any topic, so we'll have our first question, please. Probably not on The Apprentice, however, um, <laughs> having never seen it. <laughs> Thank yes, you so much for being here today, Koki and Steve. Uh, being from an interfaith marriage, I know that one of the most difficult experiences and uh, periods of that time is raising our children and determining how we will raise them and in, in what faith, and I'd be interested in knowing how you two have determined that, did determine that. We raised them as both, um, and um, which which their cousins on both sides thought was unfair totally because you know they got more presents. Uh, but um, uh, they they were very much raised in, in both traditions. And uh, look, there are there are basically three choices with elaborations, right? You can do both, you can do nothing, or you can choose one or the other. And we make no, uh, unlike some other <laughs> folks, we don't preach one version or even encourage people in one version. But for us, uh, there was really no choice because from the very beginning, a big part of what we liked and, and, and came to love and admire and embrace about each other was the fact that we, we recognized in each other 
fellow old-fashioned uh, people devoted to tradition and to family. Neither one of us. We were um, old-fashioned then. You can imagine what we're like now. <laughs> <laughs> Ancient. But um, that was a big part of who we were. Uh, you know, we were both rooted in, 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 our, in our histories and our traditions. And so um, one word we've never spoken to each other in 45 years is conversion because it wouldn't be us. Uh, it, it's right for some people. It is right for many people to choose one or the other, but not for us. It, because, uh, uh, and, and, and look, and, and there are difficulties associated with that. Our son always said, you know, uh, he, it was easy for you and, and mom. I mean, you knew who you were. We were the experiment. He said and, this when he was a teenager and saying all kinds of obnoxious yeah, things. Uh, <laughs> but, but of course, he was right about that. <laughs> But one of the things that um, I've come to understand, uh, you know, uh, 11 years ago, we wrote a book about an interfaith marriage from this day forward. And when we traveled uh, around the country, to Cleveland and many other places, um, people would often come up to us and, and kind of whisper, you know, my daughter married an Italian. You know, and they wouldn't say it openly, and they wouldn't really talk about it openly. 10, 11 years later, it's become so much more open and accepted. And, and, and institutions, Jewish institutions and others, have now come openly to deal with this. We were in Atlanta just a few weeks ago, and the Jewish Community Center there had a $200,000 um, grant from the Jewish Federation specifically to create programs for interfaith families. So and that never would have been true. So, so here's a really awful thing that just happened. We were just given the Productive Aging Award. <laughs> I mean, really, it was, it was grim. Um, by, um, by the Jewish Council on the Aging in Washington. And a rabbi from a very conservative congregation was there and basically said, um, you know, we, this is the world. We have to deal with it. And uh, that's a big change. And I have to tell you one other thing that, uh, in terms of awards, uh, we spoke at the, um, uh, at, in Boca Raton, oh. uh, at <laughs> the meeting of Hadassah in Boca Raton, and Koki Boggs Roberts, daughter of the ambassador to the Vatican, child of the Sacred Heart, was given a life membership in Hadassah. <laughs> True story. I'm just sorry Steve's mother didn't live to see it. <laughs> <laughs> she now, wouldn't believe it. Now, when you talk about Boca Raton, you're talking Major League oh, Hadassah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about the Major League. In this fact, is not the Steve told this story to somebody, and, and one woman piped up, which chapter? Yeah. <laughs> Since you have a bipartisan marriage, so to speak, could you comment on the government? Are we ever going to survive this partisanship and also about the uh, seemingly increasing role of religion in government. Do you think we'll kind of back off of that? Well, I, I'll take the second part first, uh, because I really don't think it's increasingly uh, religious. We've had lots of periods of our history where we've had religion very much involved in government. So uh, it's just a question of you know which religion and when. In terms of the partisanship, um, I don't think we're going to see any backing off on it anytime soon. Uh, Charlie Bolton is over here, whose father and grandmother were both in Congress um, uh, from here, uh, and wonderful members of Congress, were there at a time uh, when my parents were there as well, when there was, was bipartisanship. And um, I mean, they were fierce partisans, uh, but they were still friends and could get things done. My, my last interview with President Ford, he said to me, you know, Koki, when I was minority leader and your father was majority leader, uh, we would get in a cab together and go down to something like the press club and we would say, okay, what are we gonna argue about? You know? And he said, and then it would be a legitimate debate. We genuinely disagreed about uh, means to an end but then we'd get back in the cab and be best friends, you know, and uh, go back to the hill and, and be able to have a, a strong friendship, as, as, as I continued to do with his children. But um, the, the period when they were all there, I have come to believe was really the aberrant period, because I write all these history books. And uh, in the earlier times in our history, people in the House of Representatives would actually call each other out 
on the floor and go out to Bladensburg and shoot each other um, over political speech. You know, the, the Burr-Hamilton duel was just the most famous, but they were all doing it. And think of Burr-Hamilton. Aaron Burr was the sitting vice president of the United States when he murdered his political enemy over political speech. You know, our last vice president had a problem with a gun, but as far as I know, it wasn't him. So, so, and then of course it got much, much, much worse as it, in the lead up to the Civil War, and it led to war. Uh, so I, I think that, um, that we are not in our worst period. Um, it is the period after World War II. I think was deeply, deeply influenced by World War II where all of these men were veterans. They were literally in foxholes together. They knew the enemy was the dictator across the ocean, not the guy across the aisle. And the whole country had been to war. And so there was a sense of shared sacrifice and, and everybody being in it together. That is not the case in Washington today. And, um, and the partisanship is fierce. It is exacerbated by the media. And, um, and I don't think that there's really any hope of it uh, being uh, ameliorated unless the voters decide they want to do that. And that's where it has to come from. It's got to come from voters saying, you know, we, we just think that this is crazy. Sit down, be quiet, and behave. And, uh, you know, but that is not happening at the moment. I want to take a, say a quick word about religion and politics. Because I'm of mixed minds about this. I think in many ways religion can contribute positively to politics. Uh, look just right now at the, uh, the role the Catholic bishops are playing on the issue of immigration is a good example. They are providing religious guidance and counseling and, and, and uh, going back to root uh, sources of, of values in counseling, from my point of view, a wise and compassionate course on immigration. Now, of course, uh, it, it is true that a lot of the immigrants are Catholics, particularly from Hispanic countries. But um, I think that's an example of religion playing a useful role in injecting values that, uh, uh, that uh, are important. But I think uh, the, the downside is when people come in to, to Washington motivated by religious values and say, and therefore, I know the truth. And, and therefore, I am the, the harbinger and the advocate of, a, of an eternal position. And once you say that, you prevent compromise because other people have different traditions and different values. So I'm all for uh, people of faith and uh, using their values to animate their political um, uh, positions and their political profiles. I think it can be very useful. Uh, but I also think that with, when you get to the point of rigidity, when you get to the point of, of being so convinced that you have the truth, uh, then you have a problem. And so I would like to see a little more humility uh, in the application of religious values to politics, but I don't want to see them disappear. Hi, good morning. Hi, Gail. Um, <laughs> so as someone who's getting married in just a couple of weeks, I was very interested. Mazel tov. Thank you. <laughs> I was really interested in how you both talked about your own uh, process of getting married as a time of potentially running, of not potentially, but of seemingly running afoul of some very um, hardcore parental expectations and, and hopes and, and values. And I just was wondering how you navigated that issue at that time and if there's any sort of tips you can give for someone <laughs> who's uh, starting going through all of that, probably for the rest of her life. <laughs> You have to understand that not only is this uh, wonderful young woman a, a great student of mine, but when uh, she won a prize, uh, when she graduated from George Washington, named for my parents. And um, so her mom and dad were nice enough uh, to come out for the ceremony. And uh, um, uh, her dad took a picture of, uh, of me and, and, and Gail uh, together, which her mom tells me the story was on her mom's desk for years, right? <laughs> and people would come into the office and say, oh, is that Gail's father? <laughs> you know. <laughs> No, actually, that's our professor. So I, um, we've had a wonderful relationship for a long time. And uh, but uh, Gail, uh, I know your parents, and I can't imagine you have a big problem with them. But I, uh, uh, but it is true, it is certainly true that parental expectations can be difficult to manage, even in any marriage. In any marriage, uh, and and part of what we learned in those years, and I give Koki and her mom a lot of credit. You know, Koki's mother did. You know, always anticipated that her daughter would be married in a church. Uh, and when um, uh, Koki said, but mom, you know, Steve has these two grandfathers alive who are uh, survivors of uh, the pogroms of Europe. 
uh, and they would not be comfortable in a church. Her mother immediately said, oh, right, of course. And uh, that's why we got married in her yard. So it's that attitude of tolerance and understanding of differences that's very important. And what young people can do to foster that is, is really, I always tell young people, every minute you invest in being with your parents, in explaining to them who you are and what you are, and, in, and particularly in a situation where you're bringing home someone who's not from the tribe. It can be um, you know, a different religion. It can be a different race. One out of every seven marriages in America today is an interracial marriage. One out of seven. So I would imagine most families in this room uh, have been through this, or if you haven't, you will <laughs> be, uh, go through this. And the key is to show your parents that you're not marrying some abstraction. You're, I, I wasn't marrying Cardinal Spellman, you know? I, 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 I was marrying, thing too. yeah, I was marrying this one wonderful, loving, warm, intelligent young woman who my father fell in love with. And at one point, he find, you know, I knew it was going to be OK when he said, you know, Steve, it would be a whole lot easier to oppose this marriage if it wasn't so obvious she's the perfect girl for you. But that didn't happen overnight. That happened over years of spending time and showing them um, that they would not be strangers and they would not be rejected. And they would, my dad wrote me a letter when I was uh, first dating Koki saying, and I have the letter and I've written about it, where he wrote and said, I'm so afraid that you will be a stranger in your household if you marry a Catholic. Of course, what he was saying was, and I would be a stranger to my grandchildren, right? And you know, even in immigrant families, this is something that I've written a lot about. And, um, one of the families in my book, from, this, uh, from Every End of This Earth, is from right here in Cleveland, the Banerjee family. And um, uh, when, when, for the immigrant experience, it's like, you know, it, it's one thing for me to go off to Harvard and, and, and bring home this Catholic, but for immigrant families, often the moment of greatest tension in their lives is when their children get married, and particularly their girl children. Because who their children choose as mates define not only who their children have become, but who their grandchildren are going to be. And so it is moments of absolute maximum stress. And you're right about that, Gail. And um, just what their grandchildren are going to be as Americans. Yeah, and, and that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the great blessing. And the great blessing at the same time. But the, the, the key to it is is time. And the key to it is um, show your parents that the, whatever fears they might have um, are unfounded because often the fears come from ignorance. They come from stereotypes. They come from legend, not from reality. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. One of the things that concerns me as a voter is the fact that it appears to me that either people are voting for the Republican line or the Democratic line rather than the members of the parties trying to find a common ground that would really benefit everybody. Maybe it goes on and we just don't hear it and see it in the news, but what is your thought about that? Well, no, there, there's not a lot of common ground. Uh, the, actually, the, the only tiny bastion of bipartisanship in Congress is among the women. Uh, and the women in the Senate actually have a regular dinner together. Uh, and I, I accuse them of just wanting to be in a testosterone-free zone. But, they, um, <laughs> but they, they actually get a lot done. You know, they sit down together and without all the trappings and, and speechifying and all of that and, and get a lot of legislation accomplished uh, as a result of, 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 of just socializing together. Uh, but, you know, there are a variety of factors that, that have led to this uh, polarization. And um, some of them are that families no longer live in Washington. I mean, when Charlie Bolton and I were growing up, we went to school half year in each place, which was great because by the time you know anybody caught on to you, you were gone. But the um, but the um, uh, families don't go to PTA meetings together or church together or just run into each other at the cleaner and all of that the way they used to. Um, the uh, the way that. Well, I, I alluded earlier to the media that, you know, you have shouting, yelling voices 
uh, particularly on cable television. And the only interest is in having the people who shout. There's, you know, producers are not interested in people saying, well, I'm actually in the middle on this. That's boring, you know. So uh, that that adds to it. The drawing of district lines has been a very key part of this. So that um, instead of voters picking their members of Congress, members of Congress pick their voters. And yes, we've always had gerrymandering. The difference is that with computers, you can really pick, you know, the blonde, one-eyed veterans uh, and get them into your, every single one of them into your district. So you never are dealing with people who disagree with you. Um, and in fact, your only likely challenge is going to be from the right in a primary if you're a Republican and from the left in a primary if you're a Democrat. And we're seeing a lot of concern about that right now, uh, particularly with the Tea Party, where uh, the, the impulse is to be a more doctrinaire, more of an ideologue because of fear of being picked off by somebody who claims to be purer than you are. And so it's it's a time when we are really uh, going through a tremendous amount of polarization. And, I, and as I said earlier, I think the only cure for it is for the voters to make it very clear that this is not something that they want to see. And, and you are seeing a growing number of people identifying themselves as independent or unaffiliated. And it's partly for that reason, because they don't, they don't like this polarization. Well, that's, no. uh, you know, it, that's true. And, and if you look at the, um, I, I think there's a disconnect between right. official right. Washington and the voting public. Because if you look at the exit polls in the last presidential election, only 20% of Americans identified themselves as liberals, and only a third identified themselves as conservatives. 44% called themselves moderates. But do you ever see moderates on television? <laughs> you know, I mean, as Koki said, it, our, our, the media is a big part of this. But that's hard. What do you put on your bumper sticker? Dynamic moderation? You know, it's, 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 but the fact is that's where a lot of Americans are. I've been including a lot of people in this room who like to see a conversation. Look, I'm, I have nothing against partisanship. I think voters should be given a choice between parties. That's one of the strengths of the two-party system. But we've seen a tremendous polarization. I just saw a statistic that was fascinating. In the last Senate, the most conservative Democratic member of the Senate, Ben Nelson of Nebraska, had a more liberal voting record than the most liberal Republican, Olympia Snow, Susan Collins of Maine. And Senator Voinovich, by the way, was in that, the former Senator Voinovich. Those were the three most progressive Republicans. And there, so there was, in fact, no overlap in the middle. None. The most conservative Democrat was more liberal than the most liberal Republican. Now, just 20 years ago, over half the members of the Senate were in that middle. Half of them. And yet today, there's nobody. In the House, it's even worse in some ways. Well, and that's part of what's happened in the Senate is a lot of people have come from the House and right. come with these very strong views. In the last Congress, there were only seven members of the House that were in this middle ground between the two parties, and six of them left the House. So there's only one left, a guy named Walter Jones. North Carolina is kind of a strange dude. Anyway, his father's a Democrat. He's a Republican, and he's always been a, a, a bit of a maverick. He's the only one in the entire House. So. There, there is this tremendous, that's not where America is. No. That's not where America is. But you, very quickly, I'll leave you with two names to understand how, what's happening. Look what happened to Senator Bob Bennett of Utah. Bob Bennett was a conservative, but a honorable uh, man in terms of his service in the Congress. He understood the institution. He was a strong conservative, but he also understood that, that, that Democrats had ideas too. And he um, co-authored a health care bill with Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Classic attempt to bridge partisan lines. What happened to him? He got that bill crammed down his throat by conservatives in Utah, and he was denied renomination. He was denied. Now, it wasn't in a primary, because Utah has a, a strange system of, 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 of caucuses. Now, and the other name I'd give you is Blanche Lincoln, who was a moderate Democrat from Arkansas who got attacked from the left in the primary because they expected her to vote like Chuck Schumer or Sherrod Brown, you know, coming from Arkansas. And she survived the primary, but was then clobbered in the general election. She was so wounded in the primary. So when you come back to Washington, what's the lesson you learned from that? 
The lesson you learn is your biggest political risk is being attacked from the fringe. It's, it's facing a challenge in the primary. So look at one more case study, John McCain. John McCain, as a, as a senator throughout his career, made a career of working with Democrats, made a career of being bipartisan, made a, McCain Feingold, the, the bills he it, it introduced with Senator Kennedy. Over and over again, John McCain in his career was someone who worked uh, as, as a, a professional legislator across party lines. But then he got blindsided from the right in the primary. He survived. But when John McCain comes back, he's a different person. Yeah, that's what happens. He's a different person because he knows where his political threat is from the right, not from the left. And so those are the, that's exacerbating the problem you, <coughs> you talk about because if you're back in Washington and you, what lessons are you drawing from the current political scene? That is, your biggest problem is, is not being pure enough for your primary voters. Good morning and thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question based on the word that Steve used, which is tolerance. But first I'd like to say I grew up as a, in a Jewish family in New Orleans. Uh -huh. And the Hale Boggs family was highly regarded in our well, household. The, the, the Jewish community was very supportive of my father when, yes. he, when he was very brave on the question of civil rights. Yes. And so that was And huge. my father was the head of the Federation in, Cle uh -huh. in the New Orleans. So. Great. What was your uh, maiden name? Baron. <laughs> right. Um, and I've lived in New Orleans, obviously, and I taught at the University of Arkansas, among other places. And I am now getting emails and letters from people I knew way back when that are so intolerant, that are purely vitriolic, hatred-driven about things that I thought we were past in the 60s and 70s. Where do you see this coming from and what do you see that we can do to put it back in the box and tape it up and throw it away? <laughs> well, one thing that has changed is that the the public discourse is, it is now impossible to be publicly racist and survive it. Now that was not true when you were growing up in New Orleans um, and when I was. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but yes, is there private, you know, undercurrents? Absolutely. And, um, uh, and we've seen that in a lot of places. Um, but I, and this is a place where I do think the religious leadership can, can be very important, um, as they were in the 60s. Um, but the, um, I think that a lot of it is, is, happens when you're in an economic downturn and, uh, and people are looking for scapegoats. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's when we start to find it. And we're seeing it um, in some parts of the country in terms of race and in lots of parts of the country in terms of immigration. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's a, unfortunately, it's, it's something that we go through in, peri in periodic moments in our history and always have. Uh, but um, that's not to say that we should just ignore it. I mean, we should raise our voices against it. No. And I think part of it is the modeling that people are getting from, the, from public voices. Now, we are nonpartisan people, we're analysts. But I will tell you that I think the voices of people like Glenn Beck are terribly destructive um, because uh, he just throws words out there, you know, without understanding them. You know, call someone a fascist and a communist at the same time, and I don't <laughs> quite understand how that can be. But, I, <laughs> but I was I was at a lunch in a, a year or so ago, speaking for a local radio station at their sort of a newsmaker luncheon, and a man gets up and and, and grabs a microphone, big beefy character, and says. Uh, why should uh, we in any way be for Obama's health care plan? I said, look, I'm not a supporter or, a, or an opponent, but I will tell you that a lot of e economists will tell you that poor people now use the most expensive form of health care, which is going to an emergency room and, uh, and using very expensive care, and that if we can somehow protect them and give them care um, uh, earlier in the process, we'll all save money. And therefore, it will be in our national interest. And he looks at me and he says, national interest? That sounds like fascism. <laughs> now, where does he learn to talk that way? <laughs> he learns to talk that way from Glenn Beck and from people like that who, who, who have poisoned our common dialogue. And so I do think you're right. I mean, um, uh, and, and I think the whole birther movement, 
um, has, is, is a reflection of some of that. Uh, uh, the, the feeling of this president is somehow illegitimate. He wasn't born here. He's a Muslim, all of that. But there's a good news here, too. When you look at the surveys on a private basis of tolerance right. of young people, it's much higher. First time in history, just a month ago, the percentage of Americans approving of same-sex marriage broke 50%. If you ask the survey, I mentioned about one out of seven marriages being interracial. If you ask young people under 30, would you be OK with a friend or a relative marrying someone of another race? 90% say yes. They don't even get the question. So, <laughs> so now, of uh, people over 65, the answer to the exact same question was 35%. So at the same time that our dialogue has been coarsened and people feel freer to be angry and hostile and, and, and vitriolic in some of their public comments, day to day, person by person, couple by couple, family by family, community by community, there is actually a rising tide of tolerance I find very hard. Yeah, that's true. May I get back to the Seder for sure. one moment? <laughs> All the Seders I've attended, there's been a lot of discussion throughout the Seder, <laughs> a lot of arguing and, and humor and everything. And I was wondering, with your large Seders, if you invite that kind of discussion, do people contribute? And it must go on forever if you have that many people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we don't have a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, exegesis of the um, of the biblical story or of uh, the um, of the ceremony itself. There's a lot of of joshing and you know of people um, uh, just making jokes and and of course a lot of people have been coming for decades and so um, you know there there are places in the ceremony where they you know inject. <laughs> but it's not one of those sort of Talmudic discussions that goes on. Now, in this book, we, we do include a lot of different places, in, again, in boxes, not in the ceremony itself. The ceremony is the ceremony. But um, in the boxes, we do say there's a disagreement about this, or there's a, you know, uh, there are different interpretations of this, or that kind of thing. And we also, uh, Steve found a lot of uh, different voices on the subject of freedom. And, uh, and included boxes from Sitting Bull and... Yeah, this is the only, <laughs> the only Haggadah you're ever going to buy. There are 3,000 Haggadahs available, so it's not, you know, uh, but um, this is the only one you're going to find with uh, readings from Sitting Bull. I, I, I and can, John Paul. And John Paul. I can tell you also that we get this tremendous pressure. I understand. We get this <laughs> tremendous pressure from, um, from people that, that main heckling is to stop. Actually. But this Seder is not the world's shortest Seder. The world's shortest Seder is nine words long. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. So, um, <laughs> that's, 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 that's. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a special forum featuring Koki and Steve Roberts, journalists and authors of our Haggadah. We want to thank Steve and Koki very much, and we want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned.